my name is Andy Gibbons. I'm from Brigham Young University. I'm really glad to be here, and I feel, uh, uh, I feel privileged to be in a group like this that has experience and that has uh, standing, I think, um, demonstrated capability as researchers and as designers. Um, I'm going to I'm go, I'm going to stick close to the text, and the re, and the reason is that uh, I'm going to say some things that I'm sure are going to inflame some passions, uh, which is what I kind of like to do, uh, and um, I want to make sure that I use the words that I've thought through rather than shooting from the hip because when I shoot from the hip I really inflame passions. I mean it's it's worse than usual. So. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that I would say is that this work is a result of a collaboration between myself and Holt Zog, who is, uh, a re went away to Canada for a while, his home country, and is now back at BYU. He was a student, now he's, he's a professional in, uh, in our library area. A member of a board of a large organization once expressed feelings to one of his friends that were at variance with those of the president of the organization. I would do things in a different way if I were in charge, he said. Later, the same person became an executive officer, and he kept the same policies that he had disagreed with. The friend asked him why he had changed his position on things. What you see depends on where you sit, was the reply. What you see depends on where you sit. Now, let me tell you my perspective as I make this uh, presentation. I sit uh, currently as an academic for 20 years, Utah State University and BYU, experience teaching people how to design, but before that 18 years in industry as an instructional designer for commercial firms. Um, a large range of military and government clients, uh, a large range of uh, Fortune 500 clients and airlines and a number of things like that. So I view it as a practitioner and as a professor. Anne Brown, one of the pioneers of design-based research, changed her point of view on research over the course of her career in her own words, which I have rearranged for narrative effect. My high-level goal is to transform grade school classrooms. My training was that of a classic learning theorist prepared to work with subjects, in parenthesis, rats, children, sophomores, in strictly controlled laboratory settings. In my current work, I conduct what Collins refers to as design experiments, modeled on the procedures of design sciences, such as aeronautics and artificial intelligence. As design scientist in my field, I attempt to engineer innovation, innovative educational environments and simultaneously conduct experimental studies of those innovations. This involves orchestrating all aspects of a period of daily life in classrooms, a research activity for which I was not trained. The methods I have employed in my previous life are not readily transported to the research activities I oversee currently. With this straightforward declaration, Brown described the beginnings of a new approach to educational research. This is what we call design-based research. The goal of Brown's new research approach was elaborated by Collins, who wrote in the same year, what is different today is that some of the best minds in the world are addressing themselves to education as experimentalists. Their goal is to compare different designs to see what affects what. Technology provides us with powerful tools to try out different designs so that instead of theories of education, we may begin to develop a science of education. But, and he puts this in italics. No, I put it in italics. <laughs> <laughs> but it cannot be an analytic science like physics or psychology. Rather, it must be a design science, more like aeronautics or artificial intelligence. For example, in aeronautics, the goal is to elucidate how different designs 
contribute to lift, drag, maneuverability, etc. Similarly, a design science of education must determine how different designs of learning environments contribute to learning, cooperation, motivation, etc. And that was Collins. Collins extends the research metaphor of design-based research far beyond education and relates it to work in aeronautics and artificial intelligence. These are realms where the term research and development apply in the broadest sense. So here's a vexation. From where we sit, how do we see design-based research? As an extension of traditional educational research methods and goals? Or as a form of research and development having, a broad, having the broader methods and goals typical of research and development. If we only look at DBR in terms of traditional educational research patterns, we risk being pulled backward as academic gravity ex asserts itself. We risk preparing future educational researchers who have a view of research that is out of sync with an increasingly entrepreneurial and commercial educational environment. Our educational research enterprise should envision itself performing a more result, results oriented function, pursuing questions across a much broader spectrum. It needs to awaken like Rip Van Winkle to the context of research and development literature and practice that has been accumulating over two centuries. So my purpose today, my vexation is, can we compare design-based research to research and development as it's practiced in the broader world? Okay, now you can turn over your picture. Does everybody, does everybody have a page with a picture? Are there any extras? Extras would be helpful. Here's some. Okay, so here's, here's the vision. Consider a vision of design-based research as a form of research and development. Research and development has become a competitive standard in virtually all technology-based industries. R&D is the means by which ideas are brought from the edges of imagination into being as products and services. All along a convoluted path of R&D, ideas join with other ideas, knowledge meets knowledge, technology combines with technology, and new processes for fabricating and distribution are discovered. The path is a long one, and it is unusual for anyone who participates in it to travel its entire length. This means that all along the way are populations of specialists in every phase of research, development, packaging, and marketing. The thing that I would emphasize at this point is that the world of education, which we are used to thinking of as a closed academic cycle, where the academics inform teachers and teachers are informed by academics, is different because education has become a commercial enterprise today. If everywhere you look, there is encroachment on educational activity by private commercial, corporate commercial uh, uh, enterprise. You can see this in the public schools, you can see it in higher education, you can see higher education responding to it with new forms which are intended to give it a new business plan. And I'm saying that if we continue to teach students research as if they were handing, dispensing things down from Sinai through controlled, uh, randomized controlled exper uh, experiments. We're going to become even more irrelevant than we are at this point in the world of things that are happening around us. R&D is carried out in a variety of venues, both public and private. You'll see that there's one, a line on this diagram that talks about private and public activities. By the way, the blue line that goes up and down like that, that's not a sine wave. Those are not maximums and minimums. That's the windy path. Uh, the windy path that you take when you do design-based research or research and development as I would call it, you don't know where it's going to lead you. It starts out sometimes in a private enterprise. It moves to a public knowledge. 
then it goes back into a private competitive uh, kind of a stance, and then it goes out into the public again. And so there is a, a kind of an alternation in this long-term process of research and development between private and public venues. The scope of R&D research spans a spectrum that stretches from basic laboratory research at one end over on the left side, that is research in semiconducting properties of selenium, to commercialization of products and services at the other, that's on the right hand side, the marketing of a new computer chip. This spectrum is so broad and so complexity and the complexity and disconnectedness of its steps and processes is such that it is unlikely that a single person or even a single laboratory is capable of spanning its entirety. All along the spectrum are different research and development activities typified by different goals, types of knowledge pursued, methodologies applied, granularity of questions, direct applicability of results, venues of activity, types and sources of funding, and proprietary intent. And this is all in the design-based research literature. There are at least three critical transition points along this continuum, and now we're looking at the black line in the center that uh, has words inserted into it. From basic scientific and technological knowledge to concept, that's one transition. That's an ideation process. From concept to prototype, that's the prototyping segment of the bar, and from prototyping to product, productization. Uh, that's the three divisions. These transitions do not represent steps toward realizing a single product or service. They represent a, converge, a point of convergence of a large body of research that has gone before into a new integration. Stop and think. We're not talking in this diagram here about one researcher plotting their weary way to a product. We're talking about a huge research enterprise that does nothing but basic research and that finally those, those findings of basic research come together into what might be a concept for prototypes that could be built and hundreds and thousands of prototypes are built that lead to a kind of a dominant design and then the field is open for dominant designs to start competing with each other until you have a range of products. We're talking about an enterprise, we're talking about the research and development enterprise that exists in industry that makes commerce possible today. So we're not talking about one graduate student plotting their way through design-based research. It's, it's programmatic in nature. Okay. Um, during the transition from knowledge to concept, a mass of interdisciplinary knowledge acquired through seemingly unrelated research, which also requires development in the process, by the way, suddenly makes sense in a way that leads to a new combination of ideas, a concept, which represents an innovation. This concept is not a product or even a prototype of a product or service. It's an isolated idea that might become real only if other forms of knowledge can be combined with it in the right way. Gathering and confirming the basic knowledge, both scientific and technological, is a painstaking process of research, and yet it is also a creative act in which bold hypotheses provide the fuel for studies that break the mold and discover something new and ultimately useful. An important part of this is, if all we're researching is the current research questions, then we're going to just find more and more details about the same basic fundamental understandings that we already have. One of the ideas of research and development is to make disruptive innovations, things that change the game. And so one of the things that has to happen is uh, this creative act with bold hypotheses that provides the f fuel for new studies. Uh, this is very much like Kuhn, uh, changing a paradigm of research. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to, um, how am I doing for time? Seven minutes. 
seven minutes left. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, I've got a copy of this that I'm going to give to everybody. So I'm going to try to, to make some implications. I've made the point that I think that research and development and design-based research are basically structurally the same thing. That it's a long process that involves who knows what path, okay? Question leads to answer. Answer leads to new questions, questions that you didn't anticipate. The mold gets broken. Disruptive innovation takes place. This extended description of the complex and winding path of R&D provides a contrast with the short and direct path that exists in the imaginations of many educational technology researchers as they expect to produce a workable and effective product. Working alone, they eventually realize that having an idea is easier, much easier, than bringing a robust product to fruition complete with a system for support, user training, and product evolution. They discover that their concepts of design, development, implementation, and evaluation were only conceptual categories, and they discover that their preparation in skills of design and the base of learning and instruction theory is a drop in the multidisciplinary ocean that is required to bring about the real and lasting change. Yet this is the path that many who are still in university studies in educational research will be obliged to take part in within an increasingly results-oriented, interdisciplinary, team-centered, and commercially driven work environment. Not revealing to students the reality of this environment and preparing it, them for it with the necessary skills before they graduate seems questionable. Not giving them appropriate experience to learn from and not giving them a sense of the wide spectrum of R&D activities and the venues and professions they might select within it leaves them underprepared and set up for disappointment when they find their contribution potential is less than others. Now, I'd like to make some statements about what I think are the qualities or characteristics of design-based research. In the paper that I'll hand out, there are qu quotes from the literature that uh, support these. First. Design-based research aims at theory improvement. Theory is involved in the design, and the outcome of the use of the product is evaluated in terms of its implications for the theory. That's a very important part. Design-based research is programmatic, contingent, and unpredictable. You don't know where the answer to a question is going to lead you. It may close off a path that you thought was going to be the fruitful path, and it may open up a path that you had not anticipated. Design-based research is multimodal. That means that design-based research uses every knowledge creation method that you can possibly think of that's ever been used in human knowledge creation history. It, re it, it requires exploration. It requires experimentation. It requires design. And you don't know which is going to come next. They can come in any order. Design-based research requires a problem to be solved as a starting point. This is because design-based research is focused on the solution of a practical problem. It was from the first. And Ann Brown, in, in that first quote that I read, shows that she was trying to solve a classroom problem. Design-based research involves an interdisciplinary team. It requires the services of computer people, of art people, of sociologists and anthropologists. It requires a robust design team. And design-based research aims ultimately at practical and applicable results. Um, it's not done research just for the sake of research. Um, it's done for a uh, purpose. Now, finally, finally, it is important to lay out reasons why this bridge between design-based research and R&D is a useful perspective for the next generation of researchers. Number one, it places research within a practical, everyday context as envisioned by Brown and Collins. Two, it helps to distinguish helpful questions from less helpful ones as the field strives to keep itself relevant in a changing and increasingly commercial world. Number three, it gives students with design-based research skills 
a way to fit as value generators in a real world of organizational practice. Number four, it brings educational research into focus as an interdisciplinary pursuit and encourages collaborations across disciplinary boundaries. Five, it shows students the wide spectrum of possible applications of their skills from basic research to in laboratories to front lines uh, of user service. Six, it places multiple research traditions, exploration, explanation, and design into perspective and into proportion, creating emphasis on a variety of research types that are underused. Seven, it provides a practical framework for evaluating the value of different research questions. So this is my vexation, this is my concern, and I don't know how it works from here, but I think it's Tom. Thank you. <laughs>